Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three of the World Climate Summit and the La Galerie by We. Uh, welcome to the Climate and Resource Efficiency Day. Uh, and welcome to our opening session uh, this morning uh, called Planetary Boundaries, the Low Carbon Economy in the Context of World Resource Use. And I'd like to welcome on the stage uh, the moderator of the session, Dr. Peter Jensen, Head of Secretariat, Head of the Secretariat at the International Resource Panel. Peter, welcome on the stage. Thank you very much, Jens, and, uh, um, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be able to address you, and it's an honor uh, to get the opportunity to, uh, to try to, to steer uh, the discussion that we'll be having today. Uh, before inviting the, uh, the different speakers up to the podium, let me just say a few words to somehow set the scene for what it is that we are discussing today. Um, I grew up in the, uh, in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, back then, the world looked very, very different from what it looks today. My father, he bought a TV because he wanted to see things with the moon landing. And I remember seeing a picture, uh, a picture of Earth uh, taken from the moon, uh, where you see the, the Earth rising. I think it's called the Earth rise picture. Uh, and it was, for me, as a small kid, it was really say, is this really this small place where we live? Is it that little spaceship? Is that ours? Is that all that we have? Because to me, the world seemed infinite at the time. Uh, but when you see it in that perspective, then suddenly you realize that we are living in, in a small system uh, that we somehow need to manage. Just like you're managing a spaceship, uh, we need to, to manage this planet. Um, back then, we were somewhere between four and five billion people. Today, we are seven and a half, going on, on 10. Um, and that means that uh, we have challenges because we are still within the same more or less closed system. Um, we have the sustainable development goals, which we are, have as humankind set up in order to try to define what does it mean to live healthily on this planet for all of us. Um, but some of the requirements coming out of that, ending poverty, ending hunger, is putting a great strain on, on the natural resources. Uh, so what we are discussing today is some of the things about what does it actually take to live within those planetary boundaries that is within this little system that we are looking at uh, and that we can see when we are standing on the moon and that may make more sense as a closed system when we see it from that perspective. Um, in order to, to discuss that, we have a distinguished panel here today, and I'm very happy to have the, the chance to, to introduce them to you. Uh, we will start by uh, a keynote speech uh, by Minister Kimo Tilli Kainen. And if I mispronounce people's names, I'm really sorry, but uh, in this international world, I think we, we have to accept the fact that people cannot always pronounce our names. Um, after that, I will, after his um, introduction, introductory speech, I will come back and we will then introduce the rest of the panel. But I think for the panel, it is good to see the keynote speech uh, from the front seats here. Uh, so we will come back and I'll introduce the rest of the panel after that. Minister, please. Thank you, Peter. I could easily recognize my name. That was almost perfect. <laughs> Good morning, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very honored to be able to address you this morning. Uh, the Earth's natural, natural resources, water, fruitful land, clean air, different materials, are fundamental for human survival, prosperity, and well-being. At the same time, the global capacities to produce these resources to a growing population are severely threatened. There's scientific evidence that four out of nine planetary boundaries have been crossed as a result of human activity. These are climate change, loss of biodiversity, land system change, and phosphorus and nitrogen cycles. 
According to recent studies by the International Resource Panel, the global population will grow by 28 percent by year 2050. And uh, the growing population is estimated to use 71 percent more resources per capita by 2050. Without urgent and innovative steps to increase efficiency, the global use of metals, biomass, minerals and other materials will more than double by 2050. So I wish that we don't have to be inside the space shuttle or moon racket uh, to realize that we got a problem. We don't have second globe or third globe or fourth globe to make use. We need to live according to the boundaries of this one planet. At least so far we haven't duplicated the globe. That means that a radical transformation in energy production and usage is needed for keeping global warming below two degrees Celsius. But as importantly, we need a paradigm change to an economy where waste is no more thought to be waste. It must be thought a valuable resource and production must take giant leaps towards enhanced resource efficiency. We need a transition from a fossil pipeline economy to a bio-based circular economy. It's huge change in our thinking and way of to, how to act. The International Resource Panel has also calculated that resource efficiency and climate action would reduce global resource use by around 28% in 2050 compared to the current trends. But that means that we need to do more. That's not enough. And that's why we are here. In addition to environmental benefits, smarter use of resources could add two trillion US dollars annually the global economy by 2050. Low carbon and energy efficient technologies not only mitigate climate change, but they also reduce air pollution, save water and cut land use. The linkage to human health, well-being and livelihoods is thereby obvious. I think that uh, countries with high material consumption need to lead the transition to a low carbon and resource-wise economies. In Finland, we believe that the future of successful economies and welfare will be based on renewable energies, sustainable infrastructures and buildings, nutrients recycling, and circular economy very widely. Finland wants to lead the transition towards circular economy or circular bioeconomy as well by example and concrete measures. We are testing new solutions, particularly for sustainable food systems, timber construction, recycling of municipal waste, and rehabilitation of contaminated land as well. Uh, to speed up transition globally, Finnish Innovation Fund Citra organized World Circular Economy Forum in June this year in Helsinki. It was a very successful uh, event. It gathered more than 1,700 um, people from around 100 countries around the world to discuss and address the topic and change, uh, change views and expertise. And uh, I'm very willing to tell you that we will continue this work next year. World Circular Economy Forum will be organized in Japan and then 2019 it's uh, coming back to Finland again. But back to what we are doing here today. We have uh, two breakout sessions following this plenary and they are focusing on extremely important areas sustainable construction and urban infrastructure, as well as circular and sustainable production. In Finland, we have established a sustainable urban development program aiming at enhancing low carbon resource smart services, but at the same time, 
equality and social cohesion for the inhabitants of cities. Internationally, we are committed to supporting sustainable consumption and production by leading the UN program on sustainable buildings and construction. Circular production or circular economy is of specific prospect among the Finnish companies. The business solutions vary from reusable postal packaging services to lightning and mobility as a service. So there are uh, very kind of chances for new kind of uh, businesses. And when we, uh, together with Finnish Innovation Fund uh, and uh, our government, when we were creating roadmap to circular economy, there were more than 1,000 stakeholders who were involved in the process, and most of them came from private sector. So that tells that uh, private sector and uh, companies are really interested in the topic, how they could improve their businesses and uh, with new kind of thinking. But dear friends, we must all be part of the change, and we need a revolution in the way we think about the economy. This revolution will support us in implementing the Paris Agreement and Agenda 2030. I'm looking forward to hearing today revolutionary ideas and innovative sustainable solutions for the benefit of people, planet and the economy. I'm very happy to be part of this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, and maybe I should just mention just a little bit of your CV as well, because they have to know where you come from. Um, because you are, in principle, you are a fairly newly appointed minister. When we had the World Circular Economy Forum, you were minister uh, for. You were just appointed as minister for housing, energy, and environment. But of course, you were minister before that. You've been minister for quite a number of years uh, and have a background in, uh, mainly in, uh, in agriculture and forestry been minister for quite a number of years now. Um, so thank you very much for this. And uh, I think Finland is one of the countries actually leading this revolution, bringing in stakeholders from both the private sector and the public sector. So it's, it's good to hear uh, somebody who's, who's out in the forefront saying we need a revolution and then actually also doing it at home. So this is not just, this is not just words, it's actually action as well. Uh, with that, I would like to start by inviting the, the panel up to the stage. Um, um, and the, the way I would like to do that is to invite uh, each, of the, uh, each of the panel members to just reflect a little bit on what they heard the minister say uh, in order to just set a little bit of context about where they come from. And so if I could start um, that with uh, Ayan. Uh, Ayan Adam, who is the director of private sector facility at the Green Climate Fund. So, uh, Ayan, if you would come up here and take a seat, and maybe we can see if we get the microphones to, to work. Um, and then you can just say a little bit more about what the Green Climate Fund is and how that relates to, to the revolution that we have just heard here. Uh, and I think, meanwhile, while you just get your microphone set, we can ask the rest of the panel to come up and sit as well and have the microphones uh, set, uh, and then I'll ask each and every one of you to, to do the same. <coughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, so the Green Climate Fund is a fund that was created as a result of the UNFCCC negotiations. And the objective mission is to support developing countries towards a low carbon uh, pathways and to prepare them for um, basically a scenario of what we would like to say one and a half to two percent um, Celsius type of a world. What would it take? How, how should they be organized? what should be their uh, low carbon and um, adaptation strategies, uh, working through uh, all the various partners from helping the countries prepare the uh, requisite plans 
uh, to engaging the uh, governments into low carbon, but most importantly in the blueprint of the Green Climate Fund is the role of the private sector facility. And that is what I had. So I am uh, the director of the private sector facility and our objective is to support developing countries to engage not only their local private sectors, but the global private sector in climate action. Why is this important? This is important because no matter how much resources, and I think there are, uh, uh, the discussion is we, you know, is to get to 100 billion um, um, on government efforts. But when you calculate the magnitude of um, the investments needed, we're talking in the trillions. So without engaging the global and the local private sector, it, we will not be able to respond to climate action. So I think that is the perspective that I would like to bring uh, to this panel. Thank you. So the very big numbers, thanks a lot for that. Um, Joost de Kluver, um, coming from, say we say, the other end of the spectrum, um, the, the small startups, um, Joost? Yep. Um, so first of all, very happy to sit next to you because that's also my focus area, developing countries. Uh, my name is Joost de Kluiver. Uh, my company uh, focuses on the collection of electronic waste, specifically mobile phones in emerging countries uh, where this recycling isn't taking place and as a result uh, leads to pollution uh, and also the loss of materials. And we create some business models uh, from, uh, let's say, a waste issue and turn it into an opportunity for urban mining, as it's called. Um, so interesting uh, the link there. Um, and just a, a few remarks also uh, to what the minister said. Um, of course, there's a bit of a competition going on between Finland and the Netherlands on who is the leader on circularity. So, uh, considering the yep, yep, <laughs> considering the conference that happened, uh, we lost. It was a great conference. Uh, Finland is definitely in the lead now. Um, but I would say it's it's also uh, uh, very um, striking to hear uh, that there's a huge involvement of businesses into the topic. Uh, we see that also a lot in the Netherlands, uh, where businesses indeed also embrace the topic of circularity as really an alternative uh, to the, let's say, uh, other discussion around uh, CO2 reduction, uh, which uh, for some companies was considered a bit of a, um, a concept that was, that was against their business. Uh, that's just the way it's being framed a bit. Whereas circularity is really also something that could really support your business. And I'd say that's, that's a big driver for companies to get involved into the topic. Um, and I, I would say that if Dutch companies are involved, you're quite certain there's money to be made, you know, how Dutch people are. Um, so uh, just maybe to, to mention just uh, the, the earth, uh, if you look at it from a distance, uh, and indeed also the view of circularity being a key topic for 2050. You just topped, uh, uh, mentioned that as well. I do see that also a bit of a risk uh, because uh, indeed circularity being a bit of a utopic discussion uh, and uh, again the roadmap towards it for 2050 uh, becoming a bit of an abstract discussion. It, circularity also is in need of very tangible and easy and sometimes often maybe also wrong but at least first steps. So there needs to be action uh, that, that's linked to the topics that are being discussed around circularity. Otherwise, it becomes just another topic of everybody's agreeing in 2050, everything will be better and we all need to change. And then, you know, what, what do we actually do? So that's a bit of a risk on the, the, um, uh, the very long-term visions that I sometimes hear. Okay, thanks a lot. Let, let's come back to that, the time perspective of some of the changes that we need and what are the, the urgent actions uh, and what are the longer term actions because I think that's, that's important for, for business to understand what are the things that we, we need to do urgently and what are the things where we have a longer planning horizon. Uh, the third one I would like to introduce is Andreas Quist Secker from uh, who's a sustainable, sustainability strategist at Rambul, um, something that I believe I can pronounce because it's a Danish word. Thank Andreas. you for that. Uh, and very, uh, very grateful to be here and thank you for the keynote. Um, I can fully support that uh, circular economy is, is going to be a very uh, important perspective in, in, in the industry I work in. I'm working with uh, sustainable building design and urban planning. Uh, and we see uh, a focus on uh, circular economy within our industry, uh, a focus uh, uh, that is increasing um, rapidly. Uh, and in Denmark, many construction uh, companies are also working with circularity. 
uh, and those companies can see a good, great business models in this. Uh, but a big opportunity is also the scaling of uh, circular econ uh, economy. Uh, how can we actually expand that, uh, not only in our, uh, in the countries in, in, in Europe, but, but also abroad? Um, I see a, a, a big opportunity there. So supporting the business to, to do that uh, will be will be great. And as as, as you mentioned, uh, the the high material consumers are not only going to be in 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 the developed countries; it's going to be in the emerging emerging markets. So we have to look at the context uh, of of those uh, uh, of those markets and see how circularity can help uh, uh, reach the the goals we have set for for, for the world uh, in in context with the environment as well. So uh, happy to be here and looking forward for the discussion together. Thank you very much. And then, uh, in the end, handing over to Stephanie Guy Torrance, who is Environment and Climate Event Climate Change Event Director at REIT Exhibitions. Uh, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you to welcome uh, me in this panel. Um, thank you for your keynote, Mr. Minister. Uh, what is very interesting in this uh, COP23, it's uh, the fact that for us, I think it's the first time we associate resource efficiency and concretely low carbon uh, economy. And uh, for me, it's a very important point because I'm working for an uh, environmental show since 15 years, which name is Polytech. And uh, regarding the environmental market, circular economy is not really a new uh, topic or concept. Uh, it's a great opportunity for uh, all the stakeholders, but it's also a big challenge. Uh, when you are talking about uh, how to do this, we have to talk with many people, institutionals, economic actors, but also local ter territories, and maybe citizens. Because to manage this uh, very big challenge, we have to engage everybody in this way. We can't do circular economy with um, just working with uh, one uh, sector of activity or just one country. We have to uh, think about how to do this globally with all people and sometimes with removing value chain, but also with moving the way we collaborate between countries. Um, if Finland um, is uh, now working in this topic, I think that you have also to uh, think how to um, do this with your neighbors and with the Europe countries and with the, the countries where you export, where you import, and uh, the collaboration and the challenge is very big. So uh, this is the first step, <laughs> you're right, and uh, um, the good, um, the good uh, visions and also the good expertise to think this, not just for the local context, but the global context, I think it's a great challenge for political also. So thank you to uh, initiate this, uh, this point in your countries, and I hope that uh, also the forum uh, you have managed this year would be also an opportunity for the world to integrate this in a policy and a new economic model. Thank you very much. And allow me just to inject a little bit of information from the International Resource Panel into this, um, because you, you were talking about the, uh, the division of, of roles and the link between different countries. Uh, one of the things that the International Resource Panel has looked at uh, is the the global resource efficiency. What, what, how is resource efficiency playing out at a, at a, at a global scale? And, and what we are seeing is that the overall uh, resource efficiency is actually going down. Uh, we see Finland, Germany, China, any country uh, striving to become more resource efficient. Nevertheless, the global result is that it's going in the opposite direction. Um, and the point, of course, the explanation for that is that when you're shifting production from, say, something that is rather efficient in Germany, uh, because of low weights cost, you shift it to China. Uh, then even though China is trying to improve, they do not use the same technology as being used in Germany. And therefore, the overall result is that for economic reasons, we're doing things in an overall less efficient way. I think that, that is where the, the planetary boundary, the, the seeing the planet as, as a closed system comes in. We need to see what are some of the mechanisms that we need to ensure that we are globally improving and not just locally improving, because it all hangs together. Uh, and so the link between, I think, the, the financial system and, the, uh, and how we are developing becomes critically important. 
Um, the way I would like then to, to run the, the next part of the discussion is I have a number of questions that, that I would like the, uh, the panel to, to try to reflect on. Um, and then towards the end, um, I believe we should have time also for some of the questions from, audience, uh, from the audience. So if you have burning questions, you know, write them down and, and bring them to us. Um, I think there will be a microphone that can be passed around when, when we get to that section. Uh, but think about issues where you would want to challenge uh, some of the panel panelists uh, on some of the statements that, that they are giving. Um, but um, Andreas, if we, can, if we can start with you, um, how can concepts like resource efficiency and the circular economy add to the fulfillment of the Paris Agreement um, if we link the two? Because we say the two are being linked. Uh, but what does that mean for the Paris Agreement? And what are, in your experience, your concrete experience, some of the things that can help? I mean, you have mentioned urban development as, as your field, so I guess that's where you will be starting from. Definitely. Thank you for that question. Uh, to put the circular economy and resource efficiency into perspective, I will just give you a, 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 some trends uh, we see within uh, the building industry and urban planning. Um, in the last decades, uh, we have worked with uh, sustainable buildings. Uh, within sustainable buildings, we also look at life cycle assessments uh, for, for building development on also on urban planning. Uh, in developed, some developed countries, we have seen that uh, uh, the energy mix are getting greener. Uh, at the same time, we haven't seen the same kind of uh, development in the construction industry for product development. Uh, but now our assessments also show that actually looking at a building lifetime, a new building lifetime, uh, the impact of materials and the impact of products is actually exceeding the, the energy consumptions in buildings. That means that uh, there are big opportunities to actually reduce uh, the CO2 emissions within construction products. And if you take that into perspective, uh, between 2010 and 2030, uh, the same uh, around uh, 3.5 times the square meters that are in the US today are going to be developed all over the world, not only in uh, developed countries, but also in the emerging market. And there, of course, we have to look at renewable energy, green energy, but what about the constructions and what about the product, the materials, the, recyc uh, the circularity of those? Uh, those are, together with, of course, uh, resource scarcity, a big opportunity, but also a big challenge. Uh, so that's something we have as, as designers, as, as consultants, have to look into, uh, but also as, as governance and, and product manufacturers and so on. Um, so in, in our perspective, uh, there are uh, circular economy and uh, resource efficiency have a clear role to, to play when it comes to uh, resource scarcity and reducing carbon footprint in, in general all over the world. Um, so we are only in the beginning of circular economy. Uh, we are only in the beginning, even though we have talked about circular economy for decades, we are only in the beginning of implementing it. Uh, but this is going to uh, have a key role to play for reaching the Paris Agreement as well. Okay, I mean, if, if, if I can try to rephrase what you say. Basically, what you are saying is that we are reaching a point where um, it is costing more in energy uh, to build products that are even cleaner than what we are saving by then using them. So if you want to build a better insulated house, you spend more energy building it than what you're saving in the end. Is that part of the problem that we're looking at? Uh, Plus all of the extra buildings that we will have? In, in some cases uh, it is, uh, but uh, it, this, this are only countries that have, have taken a, a leap uh, towards energy efficiency in the building industry. Uh, in Denmark we have done that for decades as well, uh, looking at energy efficient buildings. Uh, so yes, there is actually coming a tipping point now where the, the, the use of materials cannot uh, replace uh, the, the energy efficiency of it uh, when you look into a life cycle perspective of it. But it, of course, depends on the context, on the context of it, which countries you're in, what are the development and what are the projections within energy uh, supply and energy mix. Um, but those are some of the experience we, we, we see. And the impact of, of products and construction materials are going to be relatively bigger in general all over the world. 
but you're a consultant. So what do you say then to the people who want to build something when they come and ask, well, so what should we do? Yeah. You say there's a problem, but, but what is the solution? Yes. Of course, uh, the methods of circular economy uh, taking reused materi uh, reusing materials in, in construction, figuring out what are actually the, the building materials we have now available and how to use them as efficient as possible. That depends on the local context. So we try to look at, at what are available uh, and what are the most efficient way to, 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 to reach uh, energy efficient uh, uh, building. Kimo, you had a you had a comment on this. Yeah, thank you, Peter. If I may, it's a very interesting and important item that Andreas is talking about. And we have uh, improved energy efficiency in regulation, and we have set the bar quite high at the moment. At the same time, the energy sources of heating and cooling is turning more and more renewable because of the energy and climate policy how we can go further, how we can further improve, then we need to think the life cycle carbon footprint, where the materials and the construction period and then the use of uh, buildings is all calculated. And uh, actually, we have started uh, in Finland to develop regulation that we would convert from energy efficiency to life cycle carbon footprint by the middle of next decade. And now we are uh, doing some piloting and demonstrating work for that, uh, creating the calculation. But I think that this is the way how we can go forward, set to par in the life cycle carbon footprint, instead of trying to improve more than <laughs> possible to energy efficiency. It, it, it's, it's very important. I give one <coughs> good example about the importance of materials. We all know that uh, producing concrete creates a lot of uh, CO2 emissions. If we can replace concrete by some uh, means uh, with uh, wooden construction uh, blocks, they store carbon. They have emitted carbon from atmosphere when the trees are grown, and as far as they are kept, in a building, it's a uh, possibility to store carbon instead of in increasing emission. So this kind of perspective must be taken into account in the future. Okay, thank you. Are there others from the panel who want to pitch in on this? Joost. Um, so ju just a short one, actually. Um, what we see, at least for the mobile phone industry, is that there's, uh, there are two tendencies. Um, you have, on one hand, uh, a desire that products are made in the most ethical, sustainable, uh, repairable, etc. way. Uh, so you have a, a end product, product which is most sustainable. Um, uh, but uh, often uh, you see that the uh, key element is left out, uh, the user. Uh, and so the discussion shouldn't only be about how to create something which is best from a sustainable point of view, because if you do then have a product which the user doesn't like and will throw away quite fast, uh, that's not sustainable either. So um, I, I fully agree that you know the footprint should be lowered, uh, but a, uh, a bit of a risk uh, in, in several product lines nowadays is that we just use models uh, and sustainable criteria to determine what's best. Um, but I'm quite sure that will, uh, uh, for the building industry, there's a lot of other influences as well. But for mobile phones, for example, uh, we see that more often now, uh, that great products are being made that nobody wants. Great products are being made that nobody wants. Yes, yeah. great sustainable products. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a message to industry. Well, how do they sell them? Um, but from a financial perspective, I mean, what, what does the financial system need in order to say we can go in and, and fund some of these things when, when we see some of these problems where you're trading off uh, between so say, energy efficiency and the energy that goes into construction of something? Because maybe you end up with something where there's a resource efficiency improvement, but not necessarily much of a, of a lower carbon footprint. So I think um, I just want to phrase it in the context of developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, when we speak 
I mean, Scandinavians being very much more advanced in terms of regulatory and the consciousness. You're looking at a lot of developing countries, you don't even have the, the barriers are much higher in the context that many countries still don't have the legal and the regulatory framework um, in place for um, a low carbon economy to happen. Um, many countries, you cannot really speak about resource efficiency because huge part of Africa does not even have lights. So you're talking about creating the, you know, leapfrogging even from the traditional to distributed solar to new technologies because uh, you need to create the resource first. So I think um, in that context, I wanna uh, bring about from um, what you need to, what, what we are more concerned about is how do we create an affordable uh, uh, product where many people in de developing countries can afford? What does it take for us to change that behavior? What would it be for a consumer in Bangladesh to say, I will use an energy efficient or a solar powered electric vehicle as opposed to um, a rickshaw that is uh, using diesel. So I think for that to happen, we have to have mechanism for this consumer to be indifferent between these technologies. So one is regulation, but second is the affordability factor. So from a financial sector point of view, this is where uh, a number of blended finance, how do we bridge this gap? How do we create mechanism for this consumer to afford this new uh, vehicle? So I think uh, pushing the paradigm um, at the demand and supply level, it's at the core of what we're trying to do at the GCF. And I can give more examples on this. But is this linked also to public procurement? Because public procurement is a way of creating a market of a certain size that sometimes affect the affordability. If I you don't understand what you mean by public procurement. Um, when the government, the local city councils or whatever, are buying cars, houses, whatever, if they are starting to implement certain standards in order to ensure that there is a market for these types of more sustainable products, that means that there's a greater volume being produced uh, and that should affect the affordability. Um, mm -hmm. is, is that something that we have to look more at? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, in the countries that we're working with, mm -hmm. I think governments still have low capacity. Mm -hmm. So you have times where actually the private sector leapfrogs in producing a certain amount of goods because there is an absence of an alternative. Mm -hmm. so, um, so while I think in the context of the legal and the regulatory framework, there needs to be standards set um, on many aspects, not just really the low carbon footprint, but I think um, also in adaptation, new infrastructure are being created in conventional ways. And, um, and we have seen what's just happened in the Caribbean, where should we mandate that we have uh, climate resilient roads, climate resilient ports, climate resilient. Um, so I think the, the paradigm for uh, many countries in the developing world, which have a huge amount of young population, uh, so the demographics are very different from Europe and others, is really focused on generation of new capacity. So I think the, the regulation need to take that into account, factoring in the fact that we're seeing a huge more adverse natural disasters happening in every part of the world today. I mean, I, will li I live in Korea. Yesterday, there were a number of earthquake, um, earthquakes and uh, climate hazards. So are we producing the right buildings? So it's no longer economics or, um, it, it, you know, it's not like a, you can't nickel and dime it. It's really our survival depends on it. So how you factor that in in the context of regulatory, um, I think it's gonna be imperative for regulation to take that into account. So I'm not sure that the cost of um, replacing some of these infrastructure is gonna be much higher than um, not having it that way. So I'm not, I don't know if I've answered your question mm -hmm. because I don't know what public recruitment mean in the context of the countries that we work in. Mm -hmm. So I apologize, so <laughs> I just tried to fit in. Okay, yes, Andreas. Uh, just a comment uh, on that, uh, also linking your, your two answers. Um, 
we, we see, of course, a development of, of many uh, middle-class consumers, and the amount of middle-class consumers is going to increase rapidly the, the coming decades. Uh, that also means that, the, of course, one of the key points are to improve the life, the quality of life, uh, and raise the social capital. Uh, of course, within those uh, communities. So, of course, linking resource efficiency together with raising what is good quality of life is very important. And see practical solution of that also in emerging markets are, are uh, very important uh, as well. So, public procurement or procurement in, in general uh, is, is, is essential, but coupling that with, uh, with the local community and what we can do together uh, in that context is, is going to be important as well. Stephanie, I would also like to try to, to bring you in here because you again, you're coming from a somewhat different perspective. I mean, how do you see the, the link? It's interesting hearing from you all. And uh, it's, um, the, the, I think that the, the big difficulty is that um, at every step of the building process, the goal change. <laughs> if uh, all the stakeholders engage in the building uh, production have the same goal since the beginning, from the beginning to the end, <laughs> it will be better to have at the end a uh, project which uh, just manage low carbon and resource efficiency uh, regarding to good quality of life. But um, every stakeholder just look at their goal. Um, when you talk about public procurement, this is the key point. If we can have systematically a dialogue between stakeholders before tenders to build together the framework and engage everybody from the beginning to the end with the same goal, I think that we can win time, win money, and win uh, in uh, the possibility to attend the goal. <laughs> um, and this is the main difficulty we have because everybody are used to, to work separately. Institutional and public uh, stakeholders in uh, one way, funding in another, and the uh, pragmatic uh, companies and uh, the artisans, uh, the, the, the people work and build uh, uh, another way. Um, and for me, regarding all the, the stakeholders I hear all around the years, I think that it could be the, the, the main challenge we had in the next uh, years. Um, obtain a strong dialogue before and maintain the goal from the beginning to the end. I think um, I've sometimes been explained to me that uh, people in Japan have a different way doing things than people in, in Europe. Uh, they will talk forever about what it is that they want to do. Uh, and when they then finally have everyone on board, then they'll go and do it and it will take absolutely no time. Uh, whereas we in Europe and probably in, in our culture have a tendency to you know, have an idea about where we go and then we start going and we model through and eventually we reach a result as well. But it's, it's a very different approach. And I think what, what you're talking about is very much about let's get everybody on board so that we know what it is that we're doing so we can orchestrate uh, this development. Uh, Kimo, you had uh, a response to some of this as well. Um, at least you marked with a finger before. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's very true. Just uh, comment. This uh, public procurement is uh, one tool uh, what we can use to promote circular economy and, uh, for example, lowering the carbon footprint of uh, building and construction. And actually, we have uh, just uh, two months ago released a guidebook for, uh, for, for, for example, cities and municipalities when they are doing public procurement. How to set criteria, uh, for example, to have renewable materials or recycled non-renewables when they are doing public procurement in buildings like schools and hospitals or things like that. And um, it's one step forward, bringing the life cycle thinking ahead. But then uh, we have totally different conditions in different parts of the world. Thank you for reminding us from that. 
Uh, six weeks ago around, I visited in India and I met a number of my colleagues there and heard about the huge, uh, huge uh, need to build um, apartments for people there. Urbanization is going on. Hundreds of millions Indians need new homes in new cities and uh, they shouldn't do the same mistakes that we have done in Western countries and then try to, uh, uh, to repair them. So the idea of building smart cities at once is very important and uh, all the knowledge we can have in different parts of the world should be uh, in use everywhere. I think this brings us then to say, well, what are then some of the barriers to do the right thing, Ayan? Um, if you, what, what are the challenges faced by policymakers, business and investors while taking steps uh, to move towards a circular economy? What, what are the barriers? So um, thank you, Minister. I think uh, the Minister is right and I, in the context of India and I've covered India for many years. Um, I think uh, one, we just discussed this regulation. So, for example, in the context of India, they made uh, a very focused attention on solar. And today, solar prices in India are cheaper than clean coal. So that is a, a clear example where they said, we need to light most parts of India. We are going to give all the policy incentives to the solar market, and we will drive prices down to the level that every consumer is indifferent. So that's a clear example where you've got the policy and a lot of this is private sector led actually uh, solar development. So you, you, you have a focus um, policy, consistent incentives, uh, a huge drive and that has completely brought solar prices down in India to cheapest anywhere in the world. Um, so I think that's absolutely critical, but m most developing countries require significant amount of investments. So there's a barrier of the amount of capital that needs to be out there. Um, a lot of that capital is not in the developing countries. It is in the developed countries. So how do we de-risk using our public finance to leverage and bring all that capital into developing countries? That's another barrier that we need to discuss. And then there is low adaptation of a lot of technologies uh, in terms of building materials, in terms of waste to energy to organic compost. Large Asian cities have so many people. The amount of waste you see in places like Delhi, Indonesia, it's just mind boggling. Um, ecosystem, people are littering around oceans and you know your projects on mobile phone, absolutely. What are we doing with this waste, especially in the context of developing countries? How could we use that? Because actually it affects health matters because fish are taking, are swallowing all the plastics and there are diseases that we did not know existed. So, so the magnitude of the problem is huge. The amount of resources needed are huge consistent policy, but also focus. Like I, I keep going back to India, that focus. I think Bangladesh also focused on distributed solar um, because there is no way the country would have grids anymore. So you just leapfrog and it's just left and said, we're not gonna build this big power solar or even wind station. We're just gonna give the bulk of our people small units where they can afford. So in the context of the Middle East is the issue of water water and energy and agriculture nexus. So there's just, it's a huge problem, lots of capital, lots of coordination. I think Stephanie's point is absolutely critical. So I think that's, I'm gonna end at that, but it's just the magnitude of the problem and how do you focus to achieve certain results? Okay. Joost, I think that was almost directly to you. <laughs> um, and, and I fully agree, if you look again at the overall uh, problem uh, issue, um, I would like to prefer to call it opportunity. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's huge uh, and it requires a lot of investments. Um, but especially looking at uh, emerging markets, uh, there's, there's also a huge business opportunity which allows for these investments to be made. Um, what you see, for example, in the Netherlands is that enormous investments are being made to just increase the recycling rate with one or two percent. 
whereas if you use uh, just a fraction of the amount to collect, uh, uh, for example, electronic waste in emerging markets, the, the uh, return on investment is much higher. I would say it's also much more ethical to invest in, in that type of projects than to make, for example, the Netherlands a bit more cleaner. Um, so uh, yes, definitely there's a huge demand for funds, uh, but um, uh, looking at the opportunities which this, uh, I'd say various types of waste represent, uh, it also uh, allows for, for companies to uh, create great business cases for uh, around circularity, especially in countries where you know, circularity is not uh, um, uh, funded, uh, it's not easy to, you know, it's not available that much yet because you're quite right, the barriers in include government involvement, it includes NGOs uh, that are active on the topic, it includes uh, uh, consumer awareness, and most of that indeed is, especially in, in emerging markets again, uh, missing. So it is difficult to get started. Uh, I, I unfortunately can confirm that uh, from my own account. Um, but uh, it is a huge opportunity uh, when you are active in, in these regions. But you have uh, in the work that you do, some, some concrete business cases that actually work. Yep. I mean, what is the success criteria? Why are they successful? And if you were to expand on this, uh, what would it take to make things like that even more successful? What are the types of policies that would be needed to, to help foster some of these um, recycling schemes so that we have plastics or mobile phones or whatever not ending up in landfills or rivers yep. and fish? I would say it's 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 on on two levels. Uh, it's it's um, I just make the the, the broad the um, uh, difference here between micro and more macro level. Uh, so on a, on a micro level, there is a need to create awareness uh, on uh, business around circularity. So what we do is we pay people for waste, and you'll understand that, especially in in the bit more poorer countries, uh, that leads to a lot of um, you know people want to get involved. We now have around 2,000 people uh, in some ten, 10 African countries that are collecting mobile phones uh, as a way to generate income. Um, so to put a price on, on waste, which you know almost always has a, a value, there are of course also uh, waste streams without a, a value, but uh, plastic, electronic, uh, well, name, to name a few, textile, etc., they, they have a value. So you could just easily use a business model uh, and use that business model in emerging markets to create huge scale. And of course, for us, it's it, it's uh, a big advantage that we don't have any competitors. Unfortunately, we're still the only ones that create a business out of uh, waste collecting uh, for mobile phones in emerging markets uh, on a micro level. Looking at it, at it m on a more international point of view, I think it's quite ridiculous uh, that we have a lot of schemes here in Europe uh, that look at, uh, at uh, we, as it's called, so electronic waste, uh, on the collection scheme set up by governments purely on a national or at best on a European level, whereas especially uh, mobile phones, but also a lot of other waste products uh, like refrigerators or anything, uh, they are exported. So we have set up these schemes to clean up Europe uh, and then put a price on companies collecting waste here in Europe, but all of the waste that is being exported is just uh, ignored. Um, so I think there's also a bit of responsibility uh, from industries to tackle the waste problem on a global scale. So not just participate in collecting waste in the Netherlands or in other uh, uh, developed countries, but looking at uh, what uh, the industry creates as waste on a global level uh, and taking also responsibility. But again, I like to prefer to call it, uh, use the opportunity of collecting this waste in difficult countries, because there it really represents a problem uh, if waste becomes uh, a landfill, for example, in, in Ghana or Nigeria, it really becomes a problem. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it's a, big, um, a lot bigger impact you can have to collect it there than you could have if you do, uh, do the same here. So it's also about uh, using schemes that are already v available and broadening the, the scope to an international level. So the, the whole issue of transshipment of, of waste and used products become an, an important regulatory issue. I mean, at the World Circular Economy Forum, I was talking to someone from, I believe he was from Ghana, uh, who was involved in uh, recycling uh, old computers. 
Uh, and he said, you know, we are importing a lot of used computers because we can't necessarily afford to buy the new ones. Um, and uh, in reality, a lot of what is being imported is really waste. I mean, we see it as successful if 90% of the computers that we import as used computers can actually start, meaning that they're shipped off in reality as waste, but they're called uh, that they're going to be reused instead. So this whole area of how are we shifting our things around becomes important, I guess. Stephanie. For me, there is two key issues. <laughs> First is that the recycling business, it's uh, definitely a local business. Um, in Polytech, we have many, many recycling companies, but they are SMEs, very small companies, and they just work inside their region. Uh, they are not very used to work with the region <laughs> just next to them. So um, managing waste in uh, an international way of thinking waste, it's a uh, new way to thinking uh, the point, and uh, this is also our key point. Um, and um, the other key issue is uh, the price of the raw material. We can't def definitively develop a very um, a, a recycling economy regarding all the, the, the challenge we have if we're still in competition with the price of raw materials. Every year, my exhibitor's uh, question is the price of raw material. And they said we can analyze the success of our uh, year regarding this point. So I think that the, the institutions can help also with this, uh, with helping the recycling economy and the circular economy uh, business with regulate the raw material price in the world, not just in one country, but in the world. Because if you are in competition with this, you can't develop and continue to uh, uh, invest in new uh, recycling technology and in a way to uh, collect also in the world because it's uh, also expensive to, to manage waste. And uh, the, the limit is uh, many times that you have not the recycling activity in your region, so you can't do. You just recycle what you can do in your region. If we uh, can invest in this way with the great support of the institution regarding to the raw material price, I think we can make the second step to the circular economy business. Because I, I fully support that. I, I think the key thing that's, about, that's missing right now is a concept I think sometimes referred to as a true price for specific metals. So if you in, include the environmental impact of, for example, virgin mined metals, uh, the price is, of course, completely different uh, than the price that you get <coughs> if you extract metals from discarded products, for example, because uh, it saves up to 90% of CO2, it prevents pollution, it uh, prevents conflicts uh, if you extract metals from, uh, from waste instead of from mines. Uh, but it's difficult to create a model that really puts a price a, a real price, if you will, uh, on, on metals. Um, and now we just you know, use the, the, the global market and that doesn't make any comparison or difference, uh, sorry, it doesn't make a difference between uh, virgin or urban mind. Uh, but clearly there's a huge difference in impact. Uh, so if that's included in the price, it would be in my advantage at least. Yeah. So what you're saying is that we, we really need a global taxation scheme for for minerals, not just, I mean, raw materials, including basically the energy. Um, on a very small scale, that's something that we developed uh, because the concept of CO2 offsetting is, of course, quite mm -hmm. famous uh, and used uh, uh, globally. Uh, what we are doing now is that we offset the material footprint for some of our customers. So um, a customer of ours would buy a new phone. Uh, then we collect a scrap phone on behalf of that customer so that uh, this customer, for example, a bank in the Netherlands, could say our new phones are material neutral. So we're just experimenting with that at a very early stage, uh, but uh, especially for the telecom industry, uh, we do see that this is something that they could use as a circular model. Uh, but I definitely do think that offsetting also the materials that you use, so not just looking at CO2 offsetting, which is a very difficult topic and sometimes um, you know, not very appealing either, uh, but offsetting the materials that you use would be something uh, of a very good first step towards circularity. 
Okay, but export CO2, but you can't export waste to develop the waste economy, so we have a problem. <laughs> okay, but, but how do we accelerate these types of, of schemes? I mean, you're now mentioning your example with phones for banks, um, and that, but how do we accelerate these types of schemes where we are starting then to integrate that type of circularity thinking into the whole uh, value chain of, of products? Well, um, you know, accelerating is, is good, but we are, you know, to be to be honest, really just in the phase of getting started. So if you look at, for example, uh, uh, public procurement or, or circular procurement even, uh, it's much too early to say, uh, for example, to the Dutch government, uh, you know, start procuring in a circular way because there just aren't a lot of solutions out there. Uh, but there is a huge need to, to experiment with this topic. And there, I think the government could also play a role uh, so that uh, when they buy products, they always allow or actually maybe demand for some room to experiment on the topic of circularity so that their suppliers uh, understand the need not to just you know, keep going in the, their business as usual, their linear process, but that they uh, should show how they are thinking uh, and developing on the topic of circularity. So first of all, I would say there's a huge demand for more experiments uh, uh, because this, this leads to learnings, this leads to uh, industries understanding their role in, in circularity. Um, I would say it's uh, uh, definitely, again, as a first step, it's important to link circularity to bi existing business models. Uh, a risk right now, as I mentioned earlier, is that we want to, you know, restart the whole concept of, of the economy uh, in, in favor of circularity. Um, but you know, that way you, you have to um, uh, change so many existing frameworks. You have to change the law. You have to uh, change the way businesses work, the mindset of people. So as a first step, I think it's very important to just understand what are the existing business models and how could we change parts of those models uh, to, to promote circularity. Um, uh, I think I, I mentioned a bit uh, of the, uh, the prevention of the, the vision uh, only. I mean, again, vision is important, uh, but it's uh, most important, important, at least for now, to uh, allow maybe at first small companies to experiment uh, with the topic uh, and um, uh, collaborate. Uh, what we're doing now in Europe is a lot of collaboration with companies that are involved in the telecom industry, uh, involved in the recycling industry. Um, that are uh, doing a procurement, for example, uh, that are allow us to fail on their behalf so that they can, can learn what, uh, what, what we are doing. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think we just have to understand and, and, and accept the fact that circularity uh, for definitely the next few years will mean a lot more uncertainty, uh, which is, of course, quite difficult to, to uh, take into account when you're, make, when you're making investments, uh, but it, 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 you uh, cannot um, do an investment in circularity in the same way as, uh, that you're doing right now in more standardized business models. You need to accept uh, that uncertainty uh, and thus more risk is involved when you're investing in, in circular businesses. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a few points for now. Okay, I'll come back to that in just a little while, but Kimu, you had a, a comment on this. Peter, can I make a question? Sure. When I have heard these uh, practical problems uh, in recycling things, uh, you mentioned, uh, Stephanie, about the price competition between primary materials and circulated ones, and uh, you described uh, about the situation. Um, in the European Union, we have such a regulation that for example, all fuel zones, there must be a certain amount of uh, renewable component. Should we go forward to setting requirements for producers that there should be a certain amount of recycled material when you are producing almost anything? Is that right way forward, right kind of regulation, or should we avoid that kind of regulation? Well, I would say, uh, if I can just Please, Andres, also help me with that. But um, it depends a lot on the type of material and type of product that you're looking at. For some metals, it's extremely smart to recycle it. Uh, it's it's uh, very easy. It's environmental. Uh, for other products, it's it's more difficult. Uh, but um, definitely, uh, you know, some of my customers already ask me for 
um, urban mined, as it's called, so uh, metals extracted from, from waste, because simply it's a much better story, it's much more environmental, uh, and it's also, uh, it allows you for the long term to be sure that you will be uh, able to, to use these metals, because if you keep extracting metals from the, from the earth, at some point they're gone. If you keep using metals uh, and reusing them and recycling them, you have much more certainty that you'll uh, be able to use them in the future. That's, uh, that's a very good point, but what I'm afraid, there are certain metals that are very valuable and it's profitable to recycle them. But at the same time, it can be very little amount of the total material we are using. And if the rest, 98% is dumped or thrown away, we can't uh, raise the total uh, uh, material efficiency in that. It's good that we can keep those most valuable raw materials recycling and avoid primary materials, but how to improve the total material efficiency, like Peter was uh, a little bit worried that we are going to the wrong direction in global. What will help? Andreas? And, yes. and I think uh, Stephanie just, afterwards. Just a comment on that as well. Uh, within the building industry, uh, we see uh, transparency of, of what are the impacts, both regarding resource scarcity and uh, uh, environmental impact. Uh, not always uh, is it the best solution to reuse uh, right now, but it is, of course, some pilot projects have to do that to make it scalable, to see, okay, this is actually a solution for the future, but right now it's not an uh, efficient, perhaps, uh, solution. But for the future, we have to have these kind of uh, uh, pilots uh, to figure out uh, how can we scale it uh, in, in, in the end. So I would say, no, we, we shouldn't have uh, demand for, for reusing uh, materials uh, also uh, as you mentioned, it depends on the material s as well. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, different uh, conflicts in this uh, that has to be considered uh, as well. We have not to forget that the procurement in our world is managed by cost kilo. So they just regard the cost from the, <laughs> the invoice, you know. They are not uh, just... Uh, uh, managing the cost of all the, the life of the products. We are in front of cost killer. This is a world uh, separates between people who want to change the world and people who just want to save the revenue in six months. And reconciliate these two worlds, it's our very, very, very most important challenge. And very, this is not people in this room. This is not people in Bonn <laughs> during these two weeks. So um, I think that we have also together to, to manage it, how we can also create a new way to discuss with this cost killer to, to make and to help them rethink their way to, uh, to buy the, the, the materials and the new material in, in, uh, uh, in the, the few time. And um, when you are a recycler, uh, industrial, you are in front of this. It's you are, you, are, you just manage the, the, the day problem you have to 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 solve your your, your waste, your recycled product products. You are not thinking about uh, some uh, I don't know <laughs> world change, and uh, you you don't think about the planet. You know, recycling business. It's a very old business, uh, but th this is a very pragmatic business. And uh, they, they have not uh, this kind of discussion. And when you discuss with them, and I begin the discussion to try to reconciliate uh, resource efficiency and low carbon economy in my events uh, in 2014. And the first dic discussion I had with them, they do not understand the relation between the recycling business and climate. Uh, <laughs> between recycling business and climate. And uh, because uh, they have not this kind of consideration for the moment, so and they make the step to climate the recycling business made this step uh, with the help of the circular eco economy model. It's uh, for them a very great opportunity. But we now have to continue to help them 
uh, with uh, also uh, working with buyers, with cities, with institutional to help this uh, business to, to develop. But then mandating a certain percentage of recycled materials is, is a way of maintaining the, the level playing field. I mean, as with biofuels, you can always discuss whether the biofuels policy of Europe is a smart policy in terms of what it's doing to land use in Malaysia and whatever. But at least it's a level playing field seen from the oil company's side because they all have you know, the same percentage they need to add. So, so in that sense, there you, you do have um, something that is business neutral, at least. Um, Ayan? Um, I just wanted to come back to the question that the Honorable Minister has asked. Um, and in the context of water, um, I would think some policies for, re for reuse could be important because that's a commodity that mm -hmm. maybe today is not highly priced, but we know that in many places we're going to run out of water. And um, looking at uh, business models that would uh, ensure that we are very conscious about from policy to um, that we are reusing water. Um, yeah, you know, industries are using a lot of water. There are places that won't have water actually in 20, 25 years. So I just wanted to just add that up. But, um, uh, but there are, I think, um, there has to be some thinking as to what do you mandate and what you don't mandate. And um, I'm just thinking about water. That's mm -hmm. all. So, trying then to gradually round this off, um, is resource efficiency, is that the end of planetary boundaries? Can resource efficiency, so to speak, save us and make sure that we stay within planetary boundaries? Um, anyone want to kick off on that? Should we? Kimo. Peter, I don't know. Uh, it won't save us alone. It's one very important prerequisite. I'm sorry, but I am shown that I should be very soon somewhere else, but there's something that I would like to still say. In my keynote, I was speaking about the paradigm change in uh, how we think the economy. And uh, I have, uh, you, uh, moderator, referred to my background that I have studied both natural sciences and eco economic sciences. And I have set myself uh, a long ago a question, which one is stronger? Which one is stronger science, economy or ecology? And the world is run in a way that it's economy that is the strongest science in the world. And within economic limits, we have some amount of uh, importance that can be given to the ecological things. That's not true. It's the ecology that is setting the constraints within which we as a human being can run our economies. And to understand this logic is the first step to paradigm change, to circular economy, and to saving our planet. So this was my final message <laughs> to you. And I apologize, but I think that I must be running to face out coal of the world. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we we wish you the best of luck with that. And remember that clean coal is not just a matter of trying to wash the coal. I mean, it's not having coal at all. Um, OK, uh, then, then coming back to the question I was trying to pose here uh, to, to try to round off, uh, how, how far can we go with resource efficiency? We heard this is not, this is not the only answer. It's only part of the answer. Um, but can that bring us back within planetary boundaries on some of the things at least linking to, to the climate challenge? Yeah, I mean, um, it's of course something that you can uh, make a statement on and it's, it's difficult to, to say that it will be true or not. What I can say that's true right now is that the concept of resource efficiency is much more appealing to individuals Whereas the previous topic, uh, which was you know, key on most discussions, CO2 and, and the prevention of, uh, of um, uh, glo global heating, is much more of an abstract concept. So I think the, the key um, 
contribution, if you will, for of the concept of resource efficiency and circularity is that it much more relates to people's daily behavior. You understand that you have a product, if you throw it away, it's waste, and if you do that continuously, you will have a lot of waste and no materials. So that's, I think, one of the biggest uh, benefits, uh, both from consumer awareness, but also for businesses. It's much more understandable what you can do to contribute to the solution, uh, whereas you know uh, the 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 more abstract concept of CO2 was sometimes very challenging to get people on board and to really understand what do you need to do now. Okay, Andreas. Yes, uh, I'll just concur on that because uh, that has been uh, an abstract thing for us as well in the building industry to promote uh, as well. And by circularity, you really get ownership. Uh, uh, within the value chain of, of working with uh, resource efficiency, uh, and and as you mentioned, I think I think this this part of having an early stage uh, dialogue uh, with different stakeholders really a key message uh, to to uh, engage uh, these issues. Uh, so I was glad you you brought that up as well. Okay, um, then I would just like to oh, are there any questions from the audience? Because I mean. Yeah, there are a lot. So let's start here on the second row. And please state your, n your name and your affiliation and let's be brief because I think we have about five minutes left. Okay, my name is Henry Ries. I'm uh, German, but I'm uh, representing a French-German association which is called Energie franc -Allemande. We try to be, I wouldn't say bridge builder, we are a plumber between Germany and France and energy relations. Well, the session is called um, planetary boundaries. Well, 72% uh, of the world, I mentioned it already yesterday, is oceans. And Director Adam mentioned water. So um, I think, you know, there's a little of salmon growing uh, with all its problems, but except that, it is pure exploitation. So as I mentioned yesterday, apparently on the financing side, there is very little knowledge by the bankers to finance these very interesting pro uh, projects in biomarine and aquaculture, this and that. Um, is Director Adams in your fund, is there expertise? Because apparently there doesn't seem to be a lot of expertise in the bankers world to fund these projects. And if you don't get funding, you cannot do the projects. Okay, let's pick up another couple of questions. We had one down here, we have one here and we have one over here. So we should start with this one here. Ah, okay, then we start with this one. We take the questions and then we get the answers. May I just input from an Asian point of view? Mm -hmm. Because um, you're talking of resources and our urban and even uh, especially the rural poor, uh, if we could cut carbon, if we can stop them from using firewood and start using solar stoves, how can you do this when there is no mechanism to teach them uh, how to use it, and if, if the product is available or can they make it themselves? I mean, this is the resource that must be needed and you can really cut carbon if all the mi millions who use firewood would use solar stove. Number two, uh, the gentleman who left um, said, is it uh, economy or ecology? I think the missing factor here is conscientization and information that is effective because people don't know, they are not aware, they, there is no vital uh, information in cultural symbols people understand that they could relate to. And there is a failure of communications. In our country, they copycat Madison Avenue advertising, and that's not the way to do it. It should be like soap opera or uh, all kinds of things that people can relate to conditions and characters. I think that's a missing ingredient that technically people talk of technicalities. I'm from an artist's point of view as an earth saver. Okay, then we have one question here and one here on the uh, second row. 
Thank you. Definitely. I'm Dr. Brian von Herzen from the Climate Foundation in the United States. I have a question for Andreas, and that is specifically, I'd like to ask about a different circle, and that is the circle of the seasons. The fossil fuel burned in our buildings today will use almost all of the carbon emission allowance in 2050, all of it. And the question is, the buildings that we're building today are gonna be in use in 2050. So we must be building buildings today that are not using carbon. Now, Amsterdam has actually solved this problem, or is addressing this problem, through a technology called aquifer thermal energy storage. And in Canada, they've actually developed seasonal geosolar, which takes the heat of the summer and stores it underground for use during the winter. And similarly, the cool of the winter stored underground for use during the summer. So the question I would have is, to what extent is this already in the plans for countries like Denmark and around Europe uh, that we can set an example for uh, emerging economies and in fact develop this technology and lower the cost of this technology so the buildings that we're building in the next 10 years in India will be able to leverage this critical technology to actually eliminate dependency of fossil fuels. Thank you. Okay, and we have a last question here in the third row, the gentleman. I have to begin by saying that there is a, a resource efficiency problem here, because if we have only five minutes amongst all of us to say what, they, what we have to say. Um, and I will begin with uh, Dr. Peterson. You were talking about local and global efficiency of resource, talking about the shifting the production to China. First remark is that China very often now we, we, we hear that it is the biggest emitter of CO2. This is not true if we take into account the consumption. And that is very important. And that brings me to the point of view expressed by Mrs. Adam about the private sector. Uh, you said that uh, India was very focused on solar. I don't know if you have read the INDC of India and the first thing that is said in that document is that we have to drop the consumer civilization. And that we have not talked about it at all. We have only talked about how to produce and not about the quantity that need, needs to be produced. And of course we know with the mobile phones that Apple brings out so many uh, new things and, and people are, are mad about this because they, they will go and sleep uh, the night in order to get the newest thing. And what is new? <clears throat> um, the next point then, of course, is that we have not talked at all, at all about the production of arms. arms. India is one of the biggest buyers of arms, and the Western countries are the biggest sellers. What are the resources used to make these arms? Why don't we, why, why do we not bring this subject up at all. It has not been talked about during the last three days. And still it is extremely important, especially uh, with regard to metals, minerals, which, uh, for which the cost is also mainly social, since most of the mines are situated on, on the lands of what are called indigenous peoples. Uh, the last point is, of course, the stockholders. I will stop there. Okay. I regret, but I will stop there. There are abs absent stockholders here. First of all, there are no migrants. And that's a very important point for European countries because Europe, when it was poor, exported its population to other continents. But today, there is a problem because Europe is unable to take 5% of, of migrants. And the other stockholders who are stakeholders who are absent, of course, the unemployed and the poor. So we have to get in everybody and not just talk amongst people who are supposed to be initiated. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much for those questions. Uh, and I will now just ask the, the panel to, to very briefly reflect back on this. Uh, and, I, and I think the, uh, the first couple of, there were a couple of questions directly to you. So let's be brief because I know there are other sessions coming after this one here. So I think um, um, the question that was asked on uh, the fact that the world is all oceans and but uh, as you know, we're all obsessed with energy 
and, um, and I, I can say that you're right. There are very few people that have uh, expertise uh, in water and in financing water, water-related type of adaptation. We are making efforts, uh, but all I can say is that it's not enough, but I think we need to push further. Um, so I'm gonna leave it with that. I think another question came on in the context of um, uh, Asia and how do we uh, look at um, basically supporting um, uh, uh, interventions that would be um, going down to the bottom of the pyramid. There are some models, but more needs to happen there. And uh, cook stoves, there are many NGOs, uh, um, many microfinance institutions that are involved in this. Some of them are actually involved in the even production of it. Uh, one example for me that I have seen was uh, Seva in India. Uh, similarly, there are efforts in Bangladesh and other places and many parts of Africa where the consumers are actually involved in the design of the cook stoves um, that will be used. Um, I think the issue of information and what me methods we're using, uh, I want to say that, that that's a very fair point and I don't think we've done enough to communicate in such a way that people can fully understand. Uh, the last question is on demand, uh, demand management. Um, absolutely true, and I think you're right. There's been a lot of focus on production, but there is also a significant amount of demand management that could be done. I think I'm going to end with that. Okay, Andreas, you, there was a specific question to you. Can you sum that up in about 15 seconds? 15 seconds, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for the questions uh, regarding uh, our footprint uh, in buildings. Uh, and how will we change towards renewables also in the future to come uh, and uh, trying to carbon offset and being carbon neutral. Um, to understand your, your question correctly, uh, what we see in the development in Denmark as well is that we actually uh, regarding uh, energy consumptions, uh, regarding electricity use and energy use, uh, we have many different uh, but very efficient solutions for that. Uh, we, need, we now have seen in the energy, energy efficiency uh, perspective, we have seen an increase uh, of, of, of efficiency during the last years. We also see an energy mix from uh, electricity, which is being greener day to day. To day. We are developing uh, uh, windmills, wi wind farms as well, uh, and our uh, heating comes from district heating, which is uh, energy efficient. So many of our cities are also becoming uh, what is called CO2 neutral, but CO2 neutral in operation. What about CO2 neutral in in a global perspective, what about the downstream and the upstream of, uh, of energy and materials within city boundaries? That is a very important topic for developed countries that you have to look at the impact you actually have uh, across the border, not only in your own city or in your own building, but outside as well. And therefore, I think the value chain and the CSR politic within those things are very important. So you see at what are the impact outside. Uh, so just to sum it up, if I look at the future and look at how, is the, how are the cities developed, if they're developed in India, in China, or uh, in Africa, uh, we see a rapid increase of, uh, of cities expansions. And, and there we have, of course, have to have renewable energy and energy storage uh, that can be used up and down in electrical vehicles. That can be, there are many good uh, solutions for that. But we, have, we also have to look what is overseeing the, the materials uh, and the material used in, in that. So, so, so that is my uh, message uh, today as well. Sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, we are out of time, but I know that you have a stand right out here, so you will be able to, the Rumble will be able to address many of these questions in, in a lot more detail. Uh, I will also be around for the next couple of hours because I think there are, there are more discussions to be had and I, I agree it would have been good to have had a little bit more uh, time for, for an overall discussion with the audience and that is that's my fault as, as moderator not to have given that time. Um, but I would like to, to thank the panel for being here, uh, for sharing their knowledge and their insights and uh, hopefully inspiring people uh, to look more at the, uh, at the changing business models that we need to to, uh, to implement and develop in order to uh, work towards much more resource efficient circular economies. Thank you very much.